to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is Don't be restless while designing RESTful Web Services Hands-on Introduction to RESTful Web Services APIs And our guest speakers today are Prasanna Nilavar and Dilip Bhatt Prasanna Nilavar is a manager and Dilip Bhatt is a software product technology architect with Accenture Prasanna Nilavar has an experience of over 21 years predominantly in building industry vertical software products. In his current role, he leads the technology office of building applications for enterprise cloud within Accenture software. He has served in various roles from design and development, architecture, product management to engineering delivery. He has built software products for the healthcare industry in acute care and ambulatory domains and has also supported many open source initiatives. He has also served as an agile coach and mentored numerous product development teams. While not developing software, Prasanna loves to hike. He has scaled up to 22,000 feet of MSL in Garhwal Himalayas, playing musical instruments and playing squash. Dilip Bhatt is a software product technology architect with over 11 years of experience. In his current role as an architect, Dilip works with products enabling them for SaaS and sustenance, architecting the enterprise applications from infrastructure to execution and deployment on cloud. A Java J2 EE specialist, Dilip is also skilled in JavaScript-based server frameworks like Node.js, front-end design optimization techniques, web applications, security review, secure coding practices and standards. Unplugged from the digital world, literature interests Dilip. He has, though partially, studied the famous Sanskrit works of Kalidas, Bhasa, etc. and loves to write short stories occasionally. So, without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speakers. Over to you, Prasanna and Dilip. Thank you so much, Aradna. I hope uh, everybody had a pretty good lunch. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Prasanna Nilavar and then I have with me my uh, good colleague Dilip. Hi Dilip. Hi Prasanna. How are you? Uh, doing good. Pretty good man. Thanks. Uh, I think today we have to get started on uh, how do we do RESTful web services. And I have put up some requests here and then some assistance as well. Do I have to know any specific technology to follow this discussion? Uh, I would say you know, if you have a fair understanding of Java and then uh, it's good if you know if you know web technologies like HTML, JavaScript, CSS, jQuery, and uh, if if you have a foundation understanding about HTTP and uh, its methods, and uh, if you are aware about RDBMS now, MySQL is used in session. So if you have a fair idea about these, it's enough. And I I don't expect people to be um, real experts in going through this session. This is a hands-on introduction. So what should we expect from this session, Prasanna? Okay, uh, what we are going to do is we're going to talk about web services. Why would we need web service? What is web service? How do we do it? And a popular uh, question mark on SOAP versus REST. Uh, we will also do RESTful web services. See, essentially what I want to try here is to tell that you know we should not be restless and, and, and not feel fearful about how am I going to design a RESTful web services? So, would this be would this be more of more about concepts, or are we going to be having more of a hands on? I would say uh, we would talk about concepts first, you know, just to uh, get the ground cleared up, and more than the concepts, we will actually try our hands. You know, there is no fun if we don't get our hands dirty. So, I'm going to show some code samples as well. Sounds fun. We will also have some demonstration. Okay. Okay, let's get started in our web services. Dilip, you know, you have been to restaurants. Yep. What do you do there? You go book the table, and yep. make a reservation, then read through the menu, calculate how many portions you need if you're going with a party, mm -hmm. then you order, wait, mm -hmm. and then the thing comes to you that 
how you get served, right? Yep. What would you do in, your, in order to test your wine? You need to get trained. What I mean to say here is, until unless you know, you know what you're going to consume, and you have certain rules to follow, it's going to be a little difficult. You know, how did you feel when you first went to a fine dining restaurant? It was interesting. That you felt a little odd because you know you need to follow through certain procedures, right? Right. Let me give you another example. How would you do if you go to a, a joint like a KFC or a McDonald's or service joint? Just click the button and look at the menu over there. And it's easy and then you just follow the queue. Right. And do you need someone to tell you what you're going to eat? No. Not really, right? So there is a kind of rules of engagement that is predefined in every environment. So in a fine dining restaurant, there are certain etiquettes that are followed and until unless you are trained with that, you will not be able to fit into it. But when you go to a fast food joint, uh, things are pretty straightforward, simple. You don't have to discover anything. You get it on the floor. Right. So in web service, typically you need a producer who produces the service and a consumer who is going to consume the service. Mm -hmm. And you need some information which acts like a broker and then which tells you what you need to do. So in a self-service joint, you see the menu, you see all the instructions which are pasted just like marketing uh, charge and you understand from that and then you go and stand the queue, you wave at the lady who smiles at you and says, how can I serve you? And you make your order by looking at up where you have all the menu items, maybe you are for a burger, fries and then she will prompt you, do you want Coke as well with this? So whatever it is, you pay and then you wait for your token, you get your order and then you go find a place and sit and eat and enjoy the trip. Similarly, web services will provide you with defined rules of engagement between two different systems. A server which provides information and then a client which consumes. So it's very, very important that we need to have a client and a server. So when we are talking about uh, web services, is it always necessary to have a client and a server? Absolutely. You know, when you have a server, that's what is going to produce your information and the client is going to consume your information. So when you visit a fast food joint, you see the joint itself as a server and you as an individual is a client who is going to consume it. How about when we have two systems uh, that want to talk to each other? Web services is still applicable there also. Uh, do you mean to say that you know, if you have two servers and then if both are serving certain information, will they be able to participate in this engagement? Mm -hmm. Certainly, yes. Yeah. You know, it's between two businesses. For example, in, in our example of a fast food chain, if there is an enterprise which actually supplies uh, material, raw material to uh, the fast food chain, then that would become a server and the fast food chain would become a consumer. So a client-server model is a month for your website. So I'm going to bring up some more concepts here and um, not that we're going to take a deep dive. Um, simple object access protocol has been there for quite some time. Um, and then you know we had uh, CARBA. I don't know how many of uh, you still remember CARBA. Uh, this was the case where um, a program written in one language need to call another method in another program which is there in some other system written absolutely in some other language. To clear an example here, if I have a Java program written in system 1, which needs to make a call uh, in another program which is written in C, which is in system 2. There, there was no, nothing common in order to make that remote procedure call. So there came this call bar which actually does um, interface with definition language as the mediator in between and you'll be able to go in and hook it up and then make your calls and then execute in the remote system. We all know RPC, uh, remote procedure call. Um, where you know you you help a system to make a call in another system, and you typically make those calls, um, marshal it, and push it through the wire, and then receive that uh, message, and then unmarshal it, and then execute and return back. So marshaling and marshaling is, is a must do that. So RPC, Carba have, have lived there. Like, I I understand there would be uh, many of us who are still using so. Uh, is CARPA and RPC still popular among enterprises? I I have no idea. I don't. I really don't think so. Um, that people would still be using CARPA until unless there are legacy systems where people would have been using. 
in the era of web technologies, in the era of internet, where we see so huge growth in terms of different enterprises being online on the internet, I, I see more of web services. And SOAP is pretty popular. Right. Uh, see, today what I'm going to talk about is, is not about SOAP. Uh, it's more about uh, REST. Um, REST is representational state transfer. Roy Thomas Fielding in his uh, PhD dissertation in uh, 2000, uh, you know, he mentioned this as an architectural style. Uh, this is not really, uh, you know, any framework or a component, uh, neither this is any application. REST is purely a style with which you define an architecture. You, you mentioned that this is a architecture style and not a framework. What do I understand from this? See, just, uh, let me take an example. You know, uh, if you look at a building, you know, an office building or a house building, mm -hmm. it needs certain standard support system. You, know, you, you build a foundation, then you build columns, you build um, um, supporting trusts, and then on top of that you, you build the walls, uh, doors, and that's how you, you create the whole building. You know, um, we must have all seen different kinds of buildings. You know, a large building with no columns inside, um, with a doom structure on top, giving ample space for uh, people to, uh, you know, watch an opera or something like that. That's a different style as opposed to, uh, you know, the popular style of column-built structure that we see, which is plugged in with a glass. Too quick, you get a building up, and then you have offices which can be hosted in that. These are two different styles of architecture. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by this is, in terms of providing web service, you have to have a predefined uh, contract between the server and the client as we spoke earlier. And that is the case, then you need to have a style in which the contract is established. So if I represent um, the World Wide Web, assuming that there are no dynamic content at all, everything is static web pages. And then you have a um, HTML page with hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. So you click on a hyperlink, you go to another page. What essentially that means is you have a static state machine available and that gets transferred into your client when a request is. And that's how you can network it through and then get the whole application. So that's the style. Now when we have this style and we think that we need to build a dynamic website, a website which are on top of um, um, information chain, providing you information all the time, you need to have a lot of infrastructure which actually pulls that and that's where your, your client application makes a contract with your server application to pull the information through web services. We have popularly used SOAP and then um, we tried those methods. What I'm going to represent here is this architectural style which is REST and how this is beneficial for us, how to actually do this. So you're going to so how, how to build components for REST services? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I'm going to use uh, GSR 311, uh, which is a specification for JAX uh, Not that you know, this is some kind of a component. This, this is a way it, it defines the style on how you put your cellulite to use so that you can offer rest. So let's, let's understand what are those constraints that we have uh, with respect to this architecture. Okay. I would say, you know what, um, we know that it is client server. <coughs> And then uh, the content that gets served or the resource that gets served, you know, we need to have a stateless machine. And um, we have several layers, right? We need to provide ability to cache the resources, so it should be cacheable. And uh, it should be layer system. You know, in fact, originally when uh, uh, REST was uh, perceived, it was perceived under the context of HTTP at your application layer. It, it's not compulsory that it needs to be restricted only that. You know, you can have, you, you can actually use SMTP um, for the rest as well. You know, there is one more key important constraint is you need to provide uniform interface. So I will actually, you know, uh, show you how, what this means, what uniform interface means. So why would, uh, why would you compare uh, rest with SOAP here? Uh, I, you know, SOAP had its own um, restrictions. You know, the way you need to create SOAP is you have to build an envelope and you have to build a header and then a body. But uh, your REST doesn't follow that kind of a restriction and, and, and neither this has any official standards. 
this is not a protocol. You know, REST is not a protocol. It's just a um, architectural style. I'm going to use a component called as Apache Wink to get started, uh, which will help me. You know, Apache Wink will help me actually to bootstrap this. Okay, is it open source? Yeah, Apache Wink is an open source project. Uh, what this does is, you know, this is not something uh, new or not known to us uh, while we write web applications. When you connect to our HTTP client to manage those requests, you have a servlet. And then I'm calling it as, you know, Apache Wink REST servlet. It, 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 it uses JAX RS as per JSR 311. What it does is, you know, it helps us to do um, request processing in order to pick up the right resources and then deliver. So the REST principle lies in you ask for a resource and you get the resource. So I'm going to plug that in with my application code where you can see how I can build a logic to tell what resource needs to be served in which way. Okay. okay. So we all know, you know, HTTP um, uh, provides you these four methods, get, port, post, and uh, delete. I, I mentioned that, you know, we need to have a uniform method. Right. So am I going to build all these methods? Not really. What I'm going to do in, in order to represent REST is leverage this standard uniform methods already available in HTTP. And then scaffold everything that I need to in order to provide RESTful web services onto my application. When you say uniform method and uh, depict standard HTTP methods here, if I apply this to any resource, would it mean I can do thread operations? I mean, uh, create, read, update, and delete? Oh, absolutely. You, know, you, you got it that right, actually. Um, if I would say, uh, you know, when you ask for a resource, you are actually reading the resource. That's your get method. And uh, if you do a HTTP post, you are actually creating a, um, a resource. You know, you have a collection, you have a URL, and then you, you push um, a resource to it, then it, through the post method, it gets created there. And then, um, if you want to edit a particular one, and if you want to, say, replace, then you use the put method. Again, this is a standard HTTP method, and obviously delete is delete. So this summarizes your uh, mapping, and I can see how post, get, put, delete uh, can be mapped. Good to see this current map to HTTP methods for easier understanding. Can you show some code examples? Oh, why not? You know, in, in fact, you know, I, I never wanted to drag this as a conceptual discussion. So uh, let's get started on a core camp demonstration. Okay. Okay. So you want to know what I'm going to do in this? I'm going to do a JSR 311 JAXRS component. So we, we can download this Apache Wink library mm -hmm. from Apache uh, website. And then I'm going to bootstrap JAXRS servlet. Uh, to create my RESTful uh, web services API. I'll also show how do we write the first application. In fact, what this uh, makes is when, when you get a request through the servlet, I map it to a particular path. And for that path, I will create an application which will actually load the collection of my resources. And then for each of the resource, I will write and then go create my standard uniform methods. They are get, post, post. Put, put and lit. I'm also going to show a small code piece um, where I can write a Java client to consume this. So let's get into action. I'm going to switch to um, my Eclipse. I hope everybody is able to see the Eclipse. Yeah, you know, uh, what I've actually done here is I've downloaded Apache Link uh, into my uh, library. So I've, I've got Apache Tomcat as my server, and then I've got Apache Link libraries. These are all the jars. You know, this is available on the web in Apache website. We can go download that. I added this into my user library. And then I created a dynamic web project. Once I create a dynamic web project, uh, what I'm going to do here is, uh, since uh, I'm going to use the uh, REST servlet, I say JAX RS servlet, the servlet class is the REST servlet, or Apache Wing server internal servlet. 
uh, red sublet and then I am adding init params. So typically in your, uh, when you create a web application, uh, dynamic web application project on your Eclipse, um, you do get the name and then you define the name. And then uh, since you select JAX, JAX RS, so you get this, but you need to give this class that servlet as the server class. And then I add init parameter. What this means is the application, the main application which I override is of the class. Uh, I have created an application called as REST Info Application. So I load this on startup. What this makes is, if you remember the chart that we saw earlier, uh, on startup, when it loads up the JAX RS servlet, servlet, the application code that runs behind this is this one, which is going to pick up all the um, you know, classes that I have, which are going to serve resources. So I'm going to switch to that class. You know, just because I don't have time in the demo, I'm, I'm, I've written these classes to uh, quickly show it up on the screen. So I'm overriding this um, get class method, which is there in the application. So here, this is a collection. I'm just using a hash here. And then in the hash set, I have added two classes here. If you look at this, two classes. These classes are my application resource class. So I'm going to use uh, states list um, Java. I mean, this is a pretty simple class. There is nothing in this. Uh, this is a simple class and a very simple empty constructor. No big deal there. What I have done here, I've just created a string array list. Uh, to represent all the states of India. So I pulled this data from um, uh, Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I just created this list, nothing else, you know, just to show that um, we can serve this as one of the resource. And now, what I have done here, if you look at this method, this is the standard get method. Now, in, in order to support get method of the HTTP, I've got this annotation done. This comes from JAX RS bundle. Mm -hmm. And then the output that this produces out is of the MIME type text plane. So I'm going to return a string value. And what I've done here is I'm just running through the list of my state list and then just adding that into the buffer. And then I re return the buffer as a string. Okay. That's all I'm doing here. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start the server. Yeah, the server is started already. And then I'm going to open a browser. Okay. And then I use my uh, local host. And it's on 8080 port. And then I'm, I'm just going to cheat a little bit here when I use page. That's it. I hit enter. What did I do? I just created a, a class which can actually serve this content. And then I hit using my browser a simple get method. I used the URL, pushed it, and got this list. This is exactly what my code is doing here. So in, no need to be concerned about this loop. This is just to compose that in a decent list, that's all. And then if I want to get only a particular value, so if I want to query you know, what's my fifth state, what's my fourth state, whatever it is, that's where I have got another get method here. And then here, again, you know, it's, it's going to produce me a plain text. Uh, but what I've done here is I've added another notation for path. So here, I pick up the ID. So the path parameter ID is picked up into an int. And then what I do, I just run through that list, array list, and then using that value of that ID, uh, maybe value 5, value 4, and then return that state value. That's it. As simple as that. If it goes beyond that, then I would say I don't have this. So let's say how it works. So we see here, let's pick up states and then 
I would say five and just enter it. Voila. Do you see the list how simple it is? Yeah. Now you tell me if you want to find the next one, say sixth one, what would you do? I would just edit the URL and make it six instead of five. And do you need a contact for this? Do you need to understand what are the rules and regulations? Or is it as simple as um, you know going to your um, fast food joint and then buying a price? This is pretty intuitive. I mean, I just have to edit the state number, and if I don't know the ID, just remove the ID, you know the ID number here and hit the slash states, and I get the entire list. Super. This is pretty interesting. You know what? There are interesting mode in serving your cat. If you want just HTML output, you know what you can do? Mm -hmm. Just go and then say, instead of 6, you put um, HTML, and then hit enter. That's what you get. This is awesome. I'll show you the code, what, how it runs. So if I want HTML, what I do is, this is the key here. And I see the path here. Mm -hmm. In the previous one, I used a value with an ID. That means I'm going to consume that, and I consumed it inside this. Here, I'm going to take the path value as a HTML string. Mm -hmm. Now, when I get that, then this get HTML list method is executed. And then here, what I'm doing is just doing a plain old simple HTML composition all together, putting them all in yeah, one single list, and then showing it up. That's what I do. Okay. okay. All right. So let me show you one more thing that I did. Um, it's pretty sim simple, similar stuff as well. Uh, this is called zone list. No big deal there. Just like um, state list, I've created zone list. So you might wonder, you know, I created states. If I create zones, how do I get that path, right? So again, I give for the class itself, I give the path with okay. the slash zones. That means our application is already loaded. So for that, if I give this path, then this class is going to get loaded. So as long as I know this path, I can just hit slash zone and get the zone list? Uh, absolutely. So I, I'm going to just you know, rewind back to show where this is getting connected. Okay. So the zone list class is a simple class. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in that. I'm going to just put some get and post methods. I will show you where I have bootstrapped it. You know, if you see, I put that into this class. And if you remember, in my web dot XML, I put this exact application load to be loaded along with this exact mm -hmm. RS servlet and load on startup. So would that make it simple to understand? Yeah. So it would just mean I would have to create my own list as a class and give it a path and bootstrap it in this uh, main application. As long as this application is added in the web XML, it would be live as it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the intent here is. It's not about the code. It's about how you style this. Okay? So let's take one more example. And I'll very quickly go through this example of zone list. What I have got in zone list, <coughs> um, I've got these zones that are defined here, right? So I'm going to just uh, stop this server for a while. Okay. Um, server is stopped. Now I'm, I'm going to explain you this get method where I've done nothing, just you know, just pulled up the whole damn thing and then mm -hmm. showing it here, right? It's the same list up the array and then it is being pushed back as a string. All right. So let let's get this one first. Start the server. So the server is up. I will keep the console on. Yeah, server is up. I go to the browser. Then here, instead of uh, states, I'm going to use zones. And I get the list. So this is a pretty JSON. But how about getting a XML if I still, uh, you know, have interfaces where I probably need XML? Okay, it's simple. What you need to do is you need to give another path, right? Mm -hmm. Like how I gave HTML. I'm going to show you HTML here. You get the HTML. Mm -hmm. So you get another path. You, you write one more get method. And then in that get method, put the path value as XML. 
I'm going to show you the output first and then the code. You get that? <laughs> wow. So if you see this now, we have uh, XML output, right? So let me show you that code. It's again a simple code. You know, I've not done anything fancy stuff here. <coughs> uh, what I've done here is this is the get method. These are pretty simple get methods. You see here the value of the path is XML. Mm -hmm. So that after you hit zones, the path that you get here is XML so that you can execute that XML list method. And here I've just you know, uh, manually hand stitch everything into an XML. You so just did your mind type and absolutely. Cool. And that's how it, it, it enables the consumer to know that it's getting an application of XML type. I, you can embed whatever you want. You know, if, if your XML can be associated with an uh, XLD, uh, you can define how you want to display the well. Same thing you can do with HTML, CSS as well. This is great. I mean, uh, you can get outputs in XML, HTML, as well as JSON. How about adding values to this list? Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm going to show now. I, I was thinking you're going to have that. So what I've done here is I've created a post method. Now, no fancy, simple post method. And I say add zone. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know this method at all. That's the beauty of this type. Right. So I'm going to just use post and push a value into it. So I expect a value has to come, a string value has to come. And when it comes through, what I'm going to do is actually add that into that in into my array list. And I'm just using a supporting method here. So I just copy that into another array and then add this element and then put it back here. That's it. And then I also respond stating that you know, if I if I can do everything well, I say yeah, you know, take the status 200. Okay, that's the standard HTTP response if everything goes well. And then I pass this entity stating that you know I, I got your value and then I added this. Do you want to see how this works? Sure. I'm not going to write any HTML to post this. Instead, I use a poster plugin for uh, uh, Firefox. Okay. Would that be okay? Okay, here is my Firefox, and then I get my poster, and then spell out my URL localhost, 8080. That's RS, and then Zones. Let me just show you get ones so that now you know that it works. Uh, uh, did I miss? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You are not. Missed the protocol. Thanks. Get it? I got it. Right? I see this. Now, <laughs> you wanted me to put a new menu here, right? Mm -hmm. So let me do one thing in this poster. I would say, let's say, you know, along with the uh, northeast, south, central, peninsular, let's say islands. Islands. And then I post this. Okay. So if I post, what do you expect? That it adds to the list. Let's see what happens. OK, it said islands is added to the list. I, show, I showed you in the method that this is the response I provided. Mm -hmm. Now, did it really get into the list? Let me do it. So, let's do a get. There okay. you go. So, do you want to try putting one more value? Sure. Well, and then try out, uh, say, border frontier. And then post it. Okay, it's added. Um, then you do a get. All right, you got that. Nice. So, in this uh, code demo, I believe you know you were able to understand how um, we can uh, use Apache Wink library. Typically, I'm using Jax RS sublet. Then I connect that Jax RS RS sublet with uh, init params where I pass a value to my sublet, which is my application call. And then in that application, what I have done is actually put a class, um, a collection of classes into a hash set. And then each class is actually a resource, you know, it's going to serve a resource. For the simplicity, I've just used a single as my resource element or entity. 
uh, you can do whatever you would want. You know, you can even connect to anything else and then get those uh, uh, values and then serve it back. Only style here we need to follow is it should be uniform method, get, post, put, and delete, okay. depending on what you want to expose. That, that's the key here. So you are just creating the models and exposing it over the URL and standard uh, HTTP method will still get your job done. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Can we see a quick client for this from the uh, Java code? Yeah, in fact, you know, I understand why you are asking this code. Um, if, if I'm a web um, a browser consumer where my HTML codes are there, I'm going to use this. What if I'm a server? Right. Where there is already a server which has published REST APIs, and I am a server. I need to go fetch those uh, services right. and then consume those and do something else, maybe value add and then serve it back. Yeah. That's where you need your Java code, which is running on your server, and do the same thing. Yeah, maybe I want to show these zones on a map. So I have a small HTTP client code. I've already written this. No okay. big deal in this. Um, I've just used Apache HTTP um, library, uh, HTTP client. I created a HTTP client object, you know, it's a closable client object, so that after request you can close that. Then I create a request object here, just a get object to pass the request. And this is a parameter. If you look at this, I'm going to just put this as zones, all right, and then I say my application type is just simply plain old um, uh, text, okay, plain, plain. Well, simple plain text, all right, and then I'm going to get this response by executing this uh, request. Execute this I put the request here, execute on my client and obtain the response. So I'm doing a small trick here, you know. If I get the status code 200, mm -hmm. um, then I'm going to just show everything what I need to show at the output. If not, I'm going to throw an error, you know, just to see how I need to handle, right? Okay. And then I'm just system out dumping it now. Still there. So you can see it on the console here. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do now. All right, so let me run this as a Java client. Okay, let me save this first time, sorry. Save it, and then run this as a client. Java there client. you go. All right, so you wanted XML to be shown, right? Yeah. So I use this path. There with me, XML. We know that that's the path that we added. And then, hang on, I'm going to show you. Save this, and then run this. Watch this very carefully, what's going to happen now. What, what happened here? I used the path XML, and then, in fact, now if, if you go to my zoned list, this is the server code, right? Mm -hmm. In XML, this is actually giving me the MIME type of application XML. Okay, so your MIME type is not matching here. Absolutely. So in this case, I am actually expecting. I am accepting only text plane. Yeah. So this gives you a mechanism to validate. When you receive something, you can actually validate what you do. So let's see what happens if I change that. Application slash XML. And then I save this. And I'm going to run this again as a Java class. There you go. You okay. see the entire XML. XML Cool. So this is how you can write a small um, you know, Java client. Uh, no rocket science here. Pretty simple thing. Pretty simple code. Key element that we need to remember here is the style. Yeah. So what did we follow? We followed that it needs to have uniform method. We, we, will, we started writing that methods. You know, that's what you need more uh, to give different flavors of how you can consume your information. So consumers can actually consume, or your clients can consume your information. Okay. All right. So we are back from action. Philip, 
you know, you, you, you saw how to do this, right? Yeah. I'll throw you a challenge. You, know, you, you spent some quite, quite some time on this. Yep. About Typical enterprise class applications don't deal with small demo codes like what I've written. Right. right, exactly. So my data would be huge. Probably data in a database. database. Absolutely. When it's in a database, I throw you a challenge. How are you going to write these REST APIs on top of your huge data? You might have an ORM, you, you have model, you, you might even get those coding in Java class. How are you going to do this here? It's actually uh, interesting to uh, you know see, like you said, the framework, uh, RESTful API is not a framework, it is a style, right? So there are new frameworks that are coming in, which are developed using Node.js and Strongloop. Are you going to show these things to us? Absolutely. Okay. So what are you going to show? What do you do here? In fact, I have collected the data from the Election Commission of India for recent election. Wow. <laughs> so That's a huge set of data. Yeah, obviously. All right. And I put it in my SQL database. Okay. So I'm going to show you that uh, database and then uh, how how to wrap this particular uh, data and into a RESTful API. To and do that's, that, that's the main thing that we need, actually. You know? right. I don't want to write huge number of code. And, and be bogged up with it. Exactly. You mm -hmm. have a database already with the data and you should be uh, you know, quick enough uh, to wrap it up into a RESTful web service. So all you need to do this is uh, the strong loop ORM connector uh, with the Node.js application. Okay. It's a standard framework, uh, the Node.js installation. You can just go to Node.js.org and down for it. It's a pretty small uh, installable, about 5.3 MB. It runs on the V8 engine and you can uh, get different versions of it and installation of a uh, strong loop which is a ORM connector and this strong loop what it does is it can help you do a scaffolding and you don't have to do anything else it will automatically discover your tables you don't have to you know specify the uh, table Seven structure names. schema nothing you just have to provide a connector to it and it's going to uh, discover all your tables and its data and it also gives you an exploration uh, way to look at your RESTful API. Let's quickly take a look at it. Oh, please, you know, show us the demo. I, I'm, I'm ready to go to the course. Okay. Okay. So, here, uh, once you have installed Node.js. And that is straightforward, right? I download and double click and it gets installed. That's about it. And it's pretty uh, small, installable as well. And, and then it gets um, uh, connected with your shell. So you can use Windows shell or Unix shell. Yep. And directly run your Node.js command. Node.js command. Okay. And to install this uh, strong loop framework, all you have to do is do a npm install. This is pretty standard uh, across uh, all the Node.js frameworks. You install it globally. And then this is the name of that strong CLI. So strong loop is a command line interface. Yep. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, install it because I have done it already in the background. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, just to save us uh, some time here. All right. And uh, to create a project, all you have to do is run another command once your uh, strong loop is already installed. All you have to do is uh, write. So SLP stands for strong loop command. Right. Oh, okay. And LB, just say project, and you have to give a project name. I have already, uh, you know, created a project. Okay. I have created a project by name election uh, result server. I'm not going to uh, run it again. Okay. Yeah, it again. We, we have limited time on the demo, so you, you show us how it works. Yeah. So I'm just going to go inside it and can you can you show me now when you create a project, what really happens? Can you go to the Explorer and show us? Yeah, once you create the project, it automatically creates all these folders and all the data sources in the model. And uh, the data sources, what you have, um, I can quickly show you this file. All you have to do is give your connector details. I have okay. given here MySQL and uh, other things. My so you give the username, password here, and exactly. the connection information, OK? okay. What, what else you need? And then you have to do the discovery. Once you do the discovery, all your uh, data models will get populated in the model JS. Okay. To do the discovery, I'll quickly show you uh, the piece of code in the app JS. So 
you just need to run AppJS. Exactly. Okay. All you all you got to do is uh, you know have this uh, piece of code uncommented and run your uh, Node.js application. So uh, where do you mention your uh, connection to your database into this AppJS? The connection to the database is already there in the data sources. All right. So when you create uh, SLC YAVI project, it creates all this stuff. It and you go and edit the data sources JSON. You and give your connection and uh, uh, you know username password. You are done with it. Okay. okay. Fantastic. So from there, how do you start this? Yeah, that's simple. It's SLC run. Okay. And when you do that, you already have the application running. Look at this interesting feature here. It says browse your REST API at HTTP. I'm raring to go. Can you please show that, please? Sure. Let's head over to localhost. I'm running it on port 3000. And let's say Explorer. Here you go. Oh, I see election data here. Exactly. Let me quickly expand this. You see all your methods here. Fantastic. This has post, put, get, oh my goodness. Everything already. How, how do I run a get? You know, I, I just want to find out the election data. How do I do that? It's already uh, running here. All I have to do is write API and give my data model name. Okay. Election data. Oh, See, you're already getting all my table exposed as a JSON web service. Okay. Can you show me this, that this is the exact data that you have in your SQL tables? Of course. This is my first table, and right, yeah, and this is exact oh. table, all the winning candidate names, everything. So switching back, you can see the same details here. What, what if I want to see only, say, by constancy name? Can I make a query? Sure. All you have to do is write a filter. It's pretty intuitive. You can say filter where PC name is the name of the that you are looking for and oh, what is this I have created a simple HTML file using Ajax that hits the exact same web services and here it takes it as uh, it takes the function the name as an input get me Bangalore please Bangalore there is no uh, constraint in name by Bangalore you realize that there is a Bangalore South Bangalore South and I say get this is what it is and you can see here the endpoint URL that I am hitting and filtering where constraints in name is Bangalore South and it gives me a JSON which I am pretty formatting it into a table. Oh fantastic, fantastic. This is pretty cool. I mean how much time did it take to stuff all this? It doesn't take more than half an hour. Wow. And you will be able to query the entire database of course. and do all the methods. Of course. This is super. Fantastic. If you head over to the documentation, there are further more uh, filters and options available. Okay. Oh. I have a couple of other examples also, which uh, these are things which I have not, uh, you know, I am not posting it. There is a advice clip dot com which is hosting the API which will generate random advices of wisdom, which we have, we can quickly take a look at that. Yes, please. Again, I have a pretty HTML for this, and I have a button. When I click Get Advice, it's going to give me a advice. Hold the door open for the next person. Okay. Click again. You get another one. Yeah. All right. So, what is the code that I have to write in order to get this? And I believe you have, you have not written advice slip that is available out in the web. Obviously not. Here is the output that it generates. So, I already know the URL. So this would be a simple AJAX get. I'm doing a get for this URL and doing a JSON pass of the data that I receive. As simple as that. Okay. Now let me quickly take a look at the other um, weather related um, API. Say I'm looking for weather in Bangalore. I say get weather. Okay, here you go. This particular open uh, weather API is giving you latitude, longitude, and any other data. As you can see, you have the JSON output below. And here also I'm doing the same thing, except I'm hitting a different URL. Fantastic. This is cool. This is cool stuff.
All right. Did you like it? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, more than um, what I liked is, is your examples, you know, the way with which you created these examples and how you consumed it. See, the reason why I, why I brought that up is, you know, as per um, programmable web, you know, we see the number of APIs in the web that's growing since 2005. It's phenomenal. So this leads us to an era where cloud computing itself is, is actually pushing all the limits for people to move away from their traditional methods of writing enterprise application leveraging infrastructure. And it's also bringing in many enterprises to collaborate out on the web. So for enterprise businesses, there is no capex. You know, they always go for operational expenditure, no capital expenditure. And the business needs are really, really changing. And as for market dynamics, so that, that puts a lot of pressure on us, we developers, where we need to consume so many services. We need to put up services. We need to consume services, mash them up, and do a value add. How do we raise, you know, to provide niche services and enable a greater value add so that we bring in differentiation in our business? So that, that's how this whole uh, game is played out in this current era. So I, I believe, you know, this has been a quite good session. Yep. Um, helping us to go through how we can quickly lay our hands on uh, RESTful web services. So. We have some questions here, right? Um, we have the first question from uh, Sayed Ibrahim, and the question says, how to impose authentication? Does it need any additional query string parameters? Not necessarily, Sayed. Uh, see, it all depends on which library you are hosting uh, your um, RESTful web services on. Say, for example, I am using Strong Loop here. This internally uses uh, Express as its uh, uh, backbone for the front end. And the Explorer uh, that you saw all uh, is developed within the uh, same framework of Express that is running on the Node.js. So all you have to do for authentication is to ensure that your Express application itself uses basic, basic authentication or uh, advanced authentication. It's the same standard way that you do for any other uh, Express application. Uh, keep all your uh, user names and passwords encrypted in the database and provide access to the URL. It's as simple as you do for any other Java application. There is a model which holds all your secure data and you give access to the URLs based on um, the authentication of the user. So it's all about securing the URLs, right? You are exposing your models over the HTTP, over the URL, and you are securing it over the URL. So not necessarily, essentially, it's a model that is getting exposed. In fact, not necessarily. that's right. how the server would want the consumer to perceive it as, as a resource. Right. So we started with an analogy of simple HTML files being wired through um, hyperlinks. So that resource is being fed through. So in that context, if I use a simple form which says username and password, I go and validate that and then let him inside, right? So a similar context can be used here again. Since it's only a style, we, we can use, I think even we can use chat as well. Yep, you can. Yep. And, and plug that in and then consume, and then provide the URL of the resource back as output. Yep. I hope this uh, helps you, Sayed, uh, on this question. Uh, I see one more question from uh, Tamodar. I thanks for the question. Similar to XML and plain text, can we return JSON also? Pretty good question. Um, I believe this is about the MIME type that we used in the code sample. Um, absolutely possible. In fact, in the code sample, what we did, we defined the MIME type. And then the code assembled was to actually give out that content back. So if I want to give JSON back, I would go and specify that that's uh, that this is going to produce at the producer's um, um, uh, annotation, I would say it's going to produce text slash JSON. And then you can compose the entire JSON. You can use JSON library, any which library that you like, and then compose your entire JSON, uh, plug the data inside that, and then put it out. And then plug that. Thanks, Damodar. Um, Vishal Kumar Arur. Okay, yes, left. he has a useful question. Uh, why Jack's RSE is added to the URL? How to know zones to be added before 
HTML or XML. This is a useful question. Uh, this is the uh, this is the way we bootstrapped. You know, if we look at web XML first, we said the application is JAX-RS to point to the JAX-RS servlet. And in the JAX-RS servlet, we gave the JAX-RS uh, um, servlet class path and then we added initial parameters uh, stating that I'm going to pick up my application and that application class is given as a value to that parameter which is my REST info application um, uh, class. In that class, I actually loaded the hash set for all my resources. So this is just a simple bootstrapping. So this defines that JAX RS path for the main servlet container is provided by JAX RS servlet. And then the next application path, which is given for, um, for the application, which actually loads those classes. And each class has, for example, zone list class has a path defined right at the top of the class as slash zones. So is the states as well. So that's how we get to know that. And this is a mechanism to actually you know, help discover your data by defining how you want to go through it. You know, this gives you a simple mechanism. You have a hierarchy of your HTML documents, if you take that analogy, and then you create them into folders, and inside each folder you create a document. So here in this case, while we provided resources by bootstrapping my application, Every resource is a container in itself, and then what we serve through became a path. So that's how we, now we add that service in the path, because I gave it that way. And then we added zones, or uh, say, safe list, because they are individual resources, and the content came through them. And when it comes to how to find, how to know that whether it is zones or states, it should be in the RESTful documentation directly. Absolutely. Thanks for that question, Vishal. Uh, Damodar has one more question. I'm going to come to that. I answered Damodar. Um, Sounder Rajan, thank you for your question. Uh, how can I retrieve image file from database by RESTful API? It, uh, it's possible. You can actually, uh, you know, when you are taking RESTful API, you are talking about getting the data in the JSON format, which is pretty much always, uh, you know, uh, has the MIME type of, you know, plain text, right? You can do a quick tweak here. You can encode your images and store it as a base64 in your table, and when it actually retrieves, treat it as a, you know, uh, base64 uh, MIME and render it. All the browsers, they already have this uh, feature of understanding the base64 and rendering the images as, you know, images. You can. When you look at your database, you will see a stream of base64, and when you render it, you will see the image. That's an interesting question. All right, thank you. Uh, Krishna Prakash has an interesting um, question here. How to test REST web services? Which tool is good? There are many, uh, you know, RESTful web services tools available just like uh, uh, you have for uh, SOAP. But, you know, it also depends on the test strategy that you have. It, these RESTful web services are always exposing models and uh, giving you the data. So it's pretty much uh, intuitive to look at the uh, offerings in the API documentation and uh, you can easily, uh, you know, uh, cook up HTML and use jQuery to hit those and you can write your own... Uh, I would rather even go to a simpler step, um, Dilip. You know, I, I did my simple testing using my browser. Yeah. Firefox did a great job for me. It has <laughs> so many tools embedded in that. Right. Second, I use the Postgre plugin. Exactly. And Postgre plugin gives me all the methods that I use. All uniform methods are available. Get, put, post, delete. Everything is available. I know the URL. I go hit it. Yeah. Thank you. And I believe we're going to take our last question. Um, this question is from Kapil Sukhiani. What all security measures are usually taken while implementing something like this apart from HTTPS? HTTPS uh, predominantly is to secure uh, your connection between the client and the server so that um, all messages that go between the server and the client is encoded and uh, secure. Other than that, you know, your resources themselves would need security. So in this case, we can use any authentication method. Okay, so again, 
any of your authenticate, as, as Philip already mentioned about Express that is being used in strong loop, or you can use JAS or any method that you would need. Typically, it's a style. So in your architecture, you have your authentication component itself, authorization and authentication component, which takes care of um, your needs of security to only let in your desired clients or consumers to consume this. So it's pretty open. Um, it depends on uh, the context. It depends on the scope. It depends on the domain in which you're going to do that. And uh, you can plug in practically any kind of security that you would need. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, additionally, Kapil, the thing is, uh, when you're exposing your data model, it's not like uh, you take your entire database and expose all your models. You selectively expose only the necessary ones, right? So as long as the users really need to consume those, you expose it, and all other uh, data models, you just don't expose it. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty interesting question. You know, in fact, uh, security is certainly a concern when we talk about uh, enterprise computing, um, uh, you know, the, the large-scale business applications, which, which are not monolithic at all. You know, they, they, they are extended across, and, and cloud computing itself has created a new paradigm shift in the way with which we think about how do we even deploy enterprise applications, how do we even run them. It becomes a federation of enterprise applications out there in the web. And certainly security has its own, you now we should do one more technique session about talking about the security itself. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the principles that we need to use um, talking about security? So thanks for that uh, wonderful question. Um, and uh, I would request that, you know, please uh, share your feedback. Um, thank you, Philip, uh, for participating in this camp. And then uh, thank you all, you know, you all uh, took a lot of time. And, participating in this and our lovely questions, wonderful questions. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed in, in this presentation. Uh, thank you all and hope you have a great football. And then I turn it back to Aradna. Thank you. And I'm really thankful to our guest speakers today for conducting this wonderful webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the webinar will be available on techgeek.com by tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Prasanna. Thank you, Dilip, for taking the time out and having us. I hope you both have a great evening ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.